your team at Harvard, at your center, studied 16 cases of different rising powers challenging the dominant world power. <laughs> and of those 16 cases, your team concluded that 12 cases, war took place between a rising power and a dominant power. And in four cases, we had peace. So 12 cases of war, four cases of peace. Would you please tell us, in those four cases of peace, what happened? And why were those rising powers and the dominant power were able to have peace rather than war? Okay, so again, thank you. So the book uh, looks at the last 500 years of history, as uh, Motion says. We found 16 cases. I'm not sure this is all, but these are all that we've been able to find. Uh, 16 cases in which a rising power threatened to displace a major ruling power. And this is as given in the accounts by the authoritative histories of each of these periods. So we start with the case at the end of the 15th century and beginning of the 16th century when Spain rises to rival Portugal, which had been the dominant naval power in the period before basically Columbus. And that almost gets to war, but the Pope, who is a superior authority, intervenes, draws a line down the middle of the map that says this side is Portuguese, this side is Spanish. That's why people in Brazil today speak Portuguese, okay? So that's one of the non-war cases. In any case, in these 16 cases, 12 of them end in war. Think about World War I, 1914. Rise of Germany, impact on uh, Britain, uh, external event, triggers a cascade, end in a war. Four of them end in not war. So you ask about the four. The four cases are first, as I say, that the Spain-Portugal case. Leave that aside for a second. Uh, the second case, which is extremely interesting, is the rise of the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century, the la end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, and its impact on Britain. So we were rising at about the same time the Germans were rising. So the British, who had ruled the world for 100 years, there was the empire in which the sun never set. The 19th century was the British century. They were looking and saying, well, wait a minute, here come the Germans. So Germany is unified in 1870, begins to surge. The US, after the, after the Civil War, begins to surge. And they see two great powers emerging. But for a rising power, that is full of exuberance, that feels like our time has come. Teddy Roosevelt knew that he was gonna make the next century the American century, and we did. Now, of course, a lot of other people suffered in the course of this process, but in any case, we did emerge. The British were then brilliant. And I think the big takeaway for, for, the, for the lesson is they distinguished between what they thought was vital for them and what they thought were simply vested. And Americans have difficulty getting clear about our vital national interests. So vital for the British was the empire. The empire was Canada, India, South Africa. That's the empire in which the sun never set. That's who we were, Imperial Britain. The, the danger with Canada was that the Americans could seize it. We're all over across the Atlantic. The big problem for how are we going to get there with our defenses in time? And Teddy Roosevelt had actually looked at Vancouver and thinking that was looked like pretty interesting as well. Maybe that should be. Maybe that should be. So they were quite fearful of this. So they basically accommodated the U.S. in places where it could be accommodated and held fast on the things that they thought were vital. And they did it so artfully that by the time uh, the accommodation had been made, Americans were seeing our interests as very much aligned with the British interests. So that then when World War I came in 1914, the US was their lifeline right from the beginning for both supplies and for finance, without which Britain wouldn't have, would not have survived in the war. When we entered the war, 
we entered as their ally. In the interwar years, we became even more entangled. China is absolutely serious. Xi Jinping is absolutely serious about displacing the U.S. as the predominant power in Asia in the foreseeable future. Because he thinks that's the natural state of affairs.